We are in Massachusetts where I am preaching to the faculty and students of Mount Holyoke College. Mount Holyoke is one of our great intellectual centers and it is typical of many institutions of learning which are putting a new and stronger emphasis on moral and spiritual values here in New England. Ten years ago, this college would not likely have invited an evangelist to speak, but the climate on campus has changed. Shades of Charles G. Finney and Dwight L. Moody, those great evangelists of the 19th century, are roaming the campuses of New England again. Evangelism has emerged as a topic of interest and debate. As with many controversial subjects, students on the campus are taking sides for or against the gospel and evangelism. Conferences are held to discuss and come to terms with the problem of faith. The debate has made headlines in some New England college newspapers. On one campus, a group of students formed a society to combat what they called the creeping Calvinism in their school. But with all these varied reactions, there is today at least a willingness to discuss the meaning of the gospel. As a professor told me a few days ago, Christ has a sympathetic hearing on the campus today. The modern American university or college is a sounding board of ideas. It is a study of ideas and ideologies as students are trying to think their way through a maze of philosophical concepts. There are evangelists of many ideas, ideologies and religions on the average campus today. And almost every student is being evangelized by somebody for something. Thus evangelism for many faiths and many ideas is going on in the student world. Students are being faced with alternative views of life which call for their commitment. Among the convictions represented on campus today is the Christian concept and the Christian gospel. For the past few weeks, I've been flooded with invitations from all over the world to speak on various campuses, large and small. I've decided to give at least one third of my time to evangelism on the university campus, especially in the United States and Canada. In the next two weeks, I will be spending a great deal of time at colleges and universities here in the East, preaching to students and holding discussion sessions. During the recent election in Massachusetts, one of the candidates had a sign which read, Americans never had it so good. Certainly as we travel about this country as I've done the last few days, there is evidence that this statement is true everywhere. Billions of dollars are spent on our comfort. All the discoveries of the past have been pooled to improve our present. No longer do we fear a disease which at one time might have wiped out a whole community. None of us are hungry or enslaved. We have insurance to cover illness and social security to cover old age. We've been relieved of the powerful superstitions of the past ages. We no longer fear witches and ghosts. Even the burden of work is being lifted from us. For today machines do most of the heavy labor that was once done by human hands. Nearly every step we take leads us to some invention from which we benefit. We enjoy the freedom which was purchased with bloodshed by our forefathers. Our words are not censored. We can say and write and think as we please. With all these benefits, one would think that we would be the happiest, most fulfilled people on earth. Instead, we admit with a sigh the sickening realization that our surroundings do not make us happy or content. Though we're free to enjoy the beauties of life, we're also more frustrated than ever because in a sense, our very freedom and comfort have made us a people lacking in purpose. We have been so surfeited with things and so many obstacles have been overcome for us instead of by us that we've forgotten how to attack, resist, work and conquer. Determination has been replaced by the cliché, I couldn't care less. So instead of ushering in the dawn of a bright new shining era, we are sitting on the rim of a volcano which may erupt at any time. I find that young people on our campus today are searching for a purpose in life. They're asking, where are we going and what do we intend to accomplish in life? They want to know where we expect to go after life. Some goals need to be sought with a passion. Others need to be shunned with equal passion. The greatest thing that a Christian young person can learn is to know where God wants him to go and to head in that direction. Many Christian students ask me the question, how can you know God's will for your life? Many non-Christian students ask the same question. 
To know and to follow the will of God has been the heart's desire of people down through the ages. David said, teach me to do thy will. The Bible teaches that God has a plan for every life and that if we live in constant fellowship with him, he will direct us and lead us into the fulfillment of this plan. There are many Christians who have only God's second or third best. They have substituted the good for the best. They have missed God's perfect plan for their lives. To know the will of God is the highest of all wisdom. Jesus said, if any man will do his will, he shall know of the doctrine whether it be of God. Living in the center of God's will rules out all falseness and puts the stamp of truth and sincerity upon our service to God. The Bible says, not with eye service as men pleases, but as the servants of Christ doing the will of God from the heart. You should covet the will of God for your life more than anything in all the world. You can have peace in your heart with very little if you're in the will of God, but you can be miserable with much if you're out of his will. You can have joy in obscurity in his will, but you can be famous and wretched if you're not in his will. When Marilyn Monroe was at the height of her fame, she is reported to have said, I feel that I'm the most miserable person in the world. You can know joy while you endure suffering if you're in God's will, or you can know real agony outside his will. You can be poor and contented if you're in the will of God, but you can be rich and sad if you're out of the will of God. You can be persecuted yet have peace as long as you're in the will of God. Or you can be popular and be lonely if you're out of the will of God. The Bible teaches that God's will is revealed only to the followers of his son Jesus Christ. The Bible says, Be ye transformed that ye may know what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. God does not reveal his will through fortune tellers or soothsayers or workers of hocus pocus. His will is made known to those who have trusted Christ for salvation. He shares this secret only with those who are redeemed and transformed by Jesus Christ. The Bible teaches that God has a plan for your life. If you would know that plan, you must go to the cross and confess that you're a sinner and receive Christ as Savior and Lord. It is only through Jesus Christ that you can be on speaking terms with God and know God's plan for your life. Thus, I'm speaking today primarily to Christians. The Bible teaches that there are several ways outlined in Scripture through which we can discern and know the will of God. First, one of the ways we can discover the will of God is from the Bible. A will is null and void if it is not in writing. That is what the word testament means. You've often wondered what Old Testament and New Testament mean. The word testament actually means will. In the New Testament, we have a new will that God has put in writing. It has endured for centuries. It has never been revoked. It is still valid today. If you want to know the will of God, set aside a special time every day to read the Bible. Read it prayerfully. Read it regularly. Read it and meditate on it, and it will guide you into his blessed will. God never leads contrary to the written word. I want to repeat that. God never leads contrary to the written word. Secondly, the will of God is revealed through the Holy Spirit using the scriptures. When Christ ascended into glory, he sent the third person of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit, to live in the hearts of his disciples. Jesus said, when he, the spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. The Bible says, for as many as are led by the spirit of God, they are the sons of God. The early church depended entirely on the Holy Spirit to reveal to them the will of God. At that time, they did not have the New Testament in writing, and they did not trust their own reason or judgment. Therefore, they had to rely solely on the guidance of God's Spirit. Thirdly, the will of God can be revealed through a transformed conscience. Be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may know what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God, says Paul. When one is converted to Jesus Christ, his conscience becomes resensitized by the Holy Spirit. This is what the Bible means when it says, holding the mystery of faith in a pure conscience. 
When the conscience is perverted and seared by sin, it can be most untrustworthy. But when we are born of God, our sinful conscience is purified. Our hearts then perceive and understand how to follow and obey the will of God. To the transformed conscience, things that once seemed right will now seem wrong. Things that once appeared foolish will seem wise. And things that once seemed dull will be enjoyed. Fourthly, the will of God is revealed through circumstances. The Bible says, And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are called according to his purpose. As a young Christian, my wife Ruth wanted to be a missionary like her father and mother. But God had other plans for her life. She is a missionary indeed, ministering daily to our little congregation of five children while their daddy goes to the ends of the earth preaching the gospel. Changing circumstances reveal to her God's will, and she is happy where God has placed her, doing missionary work among her children rather than missionary work along the coast of China where she felt perhaps God might want her to go. So many of us ask God to change the circumstances to suit our own desires rather than conforming our wills to His will. God has a plan for the life of every Christian. Every circumstance, every turning of destiny is for your good. It is working together for completeness. His plan for you is being perfected. All things are working together for your good and for His glory. Don't let circumstances distress you. Rather, look for the will of God to be revealed in and through them. There may be distress, sickness, bereavement, or unhappiness in your life. Look in that bereavement, look in that sickness, look in that persecution and tribulation for the will of God, because God is building and perfecting and pattering your life after that of the Lord Jesus Christ. Remember, Jesus had to suffer, so God allows his children to suffer that they might come to the full maturity in Christ. Fifthly, the will of God is revealed through prayer. Prayer puts us in the proper attitude to discern and to know the will of God. In lonely Gethsemane, Jesus prayed, Not my will, but thine be done. For that reason, Satan trembles when he sees the weakest saint upon his knees. If the enemy of souls can keep us off our knees, he's won a major victory. It is important for you to get away with God in prayer every day. It is there, in the quiet place, away from the din and confusion of the world, that God makes his will known. We are admonished to seek out the will of God. In Ephesians 5.17, we read, Wherefore, be ye not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. Though we're constantly to seek for his will, there are a few things we can know perfectly well are his will. In the scriptures, we're told specifically that some things are definitely God's will. First, in 1 Thessalonians 5, we are told to have thankful hearts. In an age of griping, groaning, and murmuring, our whole lives should set a pattern of thankfulness. In 1 Thessalonians 4, 3, we are told to abstain from evil. We are told that it is the will of God to love each other. In 1 John 4, 7, we are told that the greatest evidence that Christ dwells in our hearts is that we love the people of God. We are to let love be the prevailing principle of our lives. These things specifically are written in the scriptures as being definitely the will of God. There are hundreds listening to my voice at this moment who are outside the will of God. You were made for fellowship with God. God has a wonderful blueprint for your life and he's patiently waiting to put it into operation. But something has gone wrong. Your air castles have crumpled before your eyes. Your hopes have been shattered. You do not know God's plan as yet because you are unwilling to submit to him. You have not heeded the command of Christ to repent of your sins. In his eyes, you're perishing. But it is not God's will that any should perish. It is not God's will that you should live under the crushing weight of sin. It is not God's will that you suffer defeat after defeat. Christ says, come unto me and I will give you rest. Dare to open the door of your heart and let God perform that miracle of pattering your life according to the blueprint which was drawn in heaven long ago. Shall we pray? Our Father and our God, we thank Thee that God does have a plan for our lives, and we can know it, and we have the strength through the Holy Spirit to live according to that plan. We pray that those listening to our voice today might come to the point of complete surrender to the will of God for their lives. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.